sniper here? Hey there, welcome to Intuition, whereby we take a look at behind the scenes of academia to find out what students really think. My name is Lila. And I'm Flint. And today we're asking, what does it mean to be a professional? So before we recorded this episode, we went out onto the streets and asked a bunch of different students what they thought it meant to be a professional. And the most common buzzword that came up was the word respect. And as far as we could tell, they meant three different things by the word respect. And those are the three things that we're going to spend the majority of this episode fleshing out. The first thing that they meant by the word respect was taking your job seriously. And by that we mean respecting deadlines and respecting schedules and respecting that you're part of a work environment which requires your presence and requires your effort in order to operate effectively. The second thing that they meant by professionalism was approaching your job with integrity and approaching your job ethically. And by that, we gathered that they meant that you need to take your job in such a way that you do not cut corners and that you communicate effectively with all of your peers and colleagues. And the third definition that they ascribed to professionalism had to do with setting appropriate boundaries with your colleagues. And by that, they mostly seemed to mean setting appropriate boundaries with people that may become your friends or were your friends going into the job. And one thing that we want to make clear before we proceed is that obviously the word professionalism evokes different things for different people. And we want to make it clear that the ideas expressed in this episode come from our conversations with fellow students. They do not constitute the be-all and end-all of what it means to be a professional, nor does this conversation touch on every single issue associated to what it means to be a professional in the workplace. Okay, so we want to do this episode a little bit differently than we've done previous episodes. And by that, I mean to say we want to illustrate the points that we've sort of teased out earlier in the episode through storytelling rather than through just sort of throwing lists at you and pontificating about what you should and should not do in the workplace. And I think that's quite valuable because as student employees and as recent enterers of the workplace, I think we've really sort of learned how to navigate the principles that we're about to illustrate quite recently. So they're fresh in our minds. And at least in my experience, I've been working since I was 11, 12 years old. I used to work in a stainless steel mill back when minimum wage was only $7 an hour. And I can really sort of relate and remember what it was like learning how to behave differently from a middle school setting, let alone a high school setting, to the actual professional workforce. It's a big jump and it's often a shocking jump. And I remember just having other friends come into the workplace after that and watching them behave as they had in school and thinking, you can't do that here. And that's something that doesn't always click to people. And so I think it's really important to be able to tell stories that you can either relate to your own life or maybe sort of ascribe to yourself Mm -hmm. moving forward. Yeah, and I think for me, it's better to sort of like learn by experiences and from stories because if you have, you know, it's, it's good to have a list of what to do and what you can't do. But for me, um, the most valuable lessons are the ones that I sort of like experience myself. And it's not somebody coming in and telling me that, you know, this is the right thing to do, this is the wrong thing to do. And just to give a background, like so since I've entered university, I've gradually sort of like shifted from like working part time or maybe working in a volunteering position and then gradually shifted into taking, I don't want to say like more quote unquote like serious roles, but I definitely, you know, work that requires more sort of like in a professional setting and now that I'm in like a full-time position here at um, the learning commons I've experienced a different way of sort of like engaging the workplace and you know how, how do I interact with people how do I communicate um, it's been a really big learning curve for me for sure and so I guess we can move sequentially from point one to point three yep. the first point that we really teased out is scheduling and by that we don't necessarily just mean a time basis, you know, showing up and being at meetings on time, Mm. we mean more so just ascribing to the necessary functions of a role in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And so what does that look like? The first thing that looks like is is scheduling and, and actually scheduling. It means showing up to work on time and it means leaving not early and it means if you do those things, reflecting them in, in your actual schedule that you submit, if, if, if that's the kind of job you have. But it also means meeting deadlines. Mm. And the nice thing about deadlines in the workplace relative to school is that they tend to be more flexible. But at the same time, we can't use that as an excuse not to get things done on time. That's true, yeah. And I think I, I, I've had a lot of people that I've worked with who just <coughs> think, well, you know, this job, I'm not going to, it's not the end of my career, so I don't need to get things done on time because it's not what I plan to do with my life anyway. Like they, they tend to treat jobs as if they're menial and inconsequential Mm -hmm. and therefore what they do doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is that even if let's say you have a quote unquote menial job, which 
you know, I don't think is the right way to put it is there's this problem wherein if you don't get your stuff done, the people whose job it is not menial for suffer, right? It, they have a harder time getting their stuff done. They depend on you. They depend on what you bring to the table. And the people who make a career out of it, maybe the owners of the business, can really suffer. Yeah, and also it's important to know that you have to sort of like start somewhere at the end of the day. If you're going to move forward to like a more quote unquote like serious or more important position, you need to know that, you know, you're going to get reference for some people. You need to know that you have been able to demonstrate some of the key qualities that Flynn, um, that you just mentioned. So it's really Important to understand that you know there's no such thing as a job too important or too unimportant. Everything you do really matters, and it's sort of like it's a reflection of your character and your work ethic, and sort of like just who you are as a person. Absolutely, and if if I'm going to use a story about this, yeah. um, I remember I had one time once where I, I was a key holder mm-hmm. for the job I had before this, meaning I was the person who opened and closed the store. And I remember one night I had to take off early. And the person who I was working with that evening wasn't a key holder, but she had been trained on how to open the store. And she said graciously that she would take my keys and come open up the next morning Mm -hmm. because I had to get out of there. I had a family emergency, which was very, I was very grateful. It was very great of her. But the next morning I showed up 20 minutes early because I wanted to help her open the store. I had to give her my keys the night before because she had to lock up. She didn't show up for three hours. Right. The store had to open at 8. It didn't open until 11. Mm. And I was sitting outside and I couldn't get into the store. And there was customers walking up to the door saying, well, why isn't the store open? We could have lost a bunch of customers that day. And having customers come in and having that dependability is one of the key factors which drives repeated customers. And a business that cannot survive without those customers, right? It's a, it is necessary to the function and the survival of that company. And in turn, it is necessary for your wage. It is necessary for your livability, mm-hmm. right? It's a, lot of, a lot of students depend on that continued wage to pay for their food. And so actually showing up on time really mattered that day. And not only did we potentially lose those customers, we also lost three hours of work for me. Yeah. Which which was my food, which right? Which valuable, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, similar to you, I also had like stories of like, um, just I, I had a retail job before and I've definitely seen people sort of not, I don't know, not understanding that, you know, if you have a work that's maybe you do on the side or it's not important, you know, if you don't sort of like take it seriously, it really impacts a lot of people. Um, I, I had a similar situation like you too. Like I had like a superiors above me who just like didn't show up for some reason. And I definitely saw how much it impacted like the business because like I would show up to that work and I was like, sitting outside the store. I work at a store mm-hmm. too for like half an hour and just like sitting outside and seeing people sort of like, being disappointed. I, I think it's, it's a really bad habit to think that you're not like an important member of like, a certain organization. You need to understand that you are hired because they see that you can contribute to the mm-hmm. organization in some way. So it's really important that you take whatever you do seriously, even though if it's your first job or that you're working part time or if you think that the pay doesn't commence rate or something. I think it's really important to find a way to take an ownership of what, what you have. For sure. And it's interesting that you brought up the fact that uh, employers also can make those sort of mistakes or supervisors. Yeah. Because I think there's this kind of perception when coming into the workforce that it's only you who needs to have integrity mm-hmm. because you need to sow your oats and make your way and they've already made it. Yeah. They're already quote unquote professionals and you're a newbie. Mm-hmm. Ergo, you're sort of subservient to them, which is it is is t- entirely incorrect way of approaching your job. And and a theme that I think is going to come out of this episode a lot is that as an employee, you're not just receiving instructions, you also have commensurate responsibilities on your employer. Mm-hmm. These responsibilities and what is professional and what is proper are not just questions of what you're doing, but also questions of what your supervisor or employer are doing. Mm -hmm. And that's an important distinction to remember. I remember I once had, uh, at the stainless steel job I was mentioning earlier, I once came in for a weekend shift and my boss didn't even show up. Wow. And the reason being was he had gone out the night before to party. Yep. And had totally forgotten, didn't wake up until uh, around 2 o'clock, 2 p.m. that no. day. <laughs> and I'd waited there for three hours. And they actually had to pay me for those hours yep. because we had an agreement on that. And I got paid a full overtime day, which is great for me. <laughs> but it's not so great for my employer, yeah. right? So that, That's really... 
I think one of the things that I, I'm really sort of like psyched about is like seeing how um, you know people approach their work and how they how they view their mentality of what what it means to be at work, what does it mean to come to work? Because I I like to think that, and you can you can argue with me if it's the right thing to think about, but I, for me it's really important to feel like I'm like a contributive member of whatever I do. Is. So and I think if you sort of like adopt that perspective, it's sort of I don't want to say make things easy, but you know if you feel like your work is like a dread to you. Um, some way or another, I feel that that maybe it's time for you to sort of like reflect on why you feel that way. Um, because it's it's always messy to have like you know members of like an organization who doesn't feel like they don't want to be there, who doesn't want to contribute. Um, and I'm pretty sure we can go off on tangent about you know what does it mean in a bigger picture. But yeah, I feel that being sort of like contributive, taking ownership, are just one of like the key things that I've realized. It's really important. For sure, and I yeah. and I guess I guess we can actually kind of make that point a little more succinctly, the first point as taking your job seriously. Yes. Right. And I think that's the thing that has come up a lot. And what you've said, what mm. I've said is that no matter what you're doing, treating yourself as a professional and mm-hmm. treating what you do as, as if it matters, yeah. taking it seriously. And so I guess the second point that we have to bring up is taking your work honestly and with integrity. And what we mean by that loosely is professional honesty what does that look like? Well, that looks like not cutting corners. That looks like whistleblowing if you see something wrong. The, the term whistleblower gets thrown out as a pejorative. <laughs> it's, it's, it's something that you don't want to be, and if you are, you're bad. But the thing is, is that engineers, for example, are trained to be whistleblowers because if they do not say if something's mm-hmm. going wrong, and, and just to define whistleblower very, very quickly, a whistleblower is someone who basically points out when a practice in the professional environment could potentially harm people or is being done intentionally maliciously, Yeah. right? And engineers are taught to do that because if they don't whistle blow and something is going wrong and let's say uh, a track that they're building, people could die. Yeah. And it's not always a situation of life and death in jobs, but it doesn't matter. The consequences uh, uh, of behaving without integrity, behaving dishonestly in the workplace can have ramifications for everyone. So, for example, let's say that you're sending uh, a damaged product mm. to uh, someone that, that you're selling it to and they get it and they build something with it that is now faulty because the uh, product was damaged and you didn't tell them that. Mm. That, that could be life or, life or death. Mm-hmm. Uh, just a few examples from my previous job. When I was working in the paint store, right, we frequently damaged paint cans. Yeah. It, it just happens, yep. right? It, it makes sense. You know, you've got hundreds and thousands of paint cans that we sell here. They're really easy to dent. They're only aluminum. Quite oftentimes, if you're sending a giant shipment of pa- paint cans, like just imagine that we have them on these pallets and they're stacked four high. Mm-hmm. You can put damaged ones in the middle. And no one's see it. And, yeah. and, and no yeah. one's the wiser, right? Because you can't see them. Mm-hmm. And they won't find out for months often because painting takes a long time. It takes you five minutes to put it on the pallet takes them five months to use the whole palette and by the time they don't know you might not even be at your job anymore yeah so that that's what i mean by honesty and integrity yeah. in the workplace and i think that just to build on to that i think uh, when people think whistleblower they think like oh you have to go in a secretive manner and mm. be like you know behind the scenes of like whispering um i just i think it's really important to to emphasize that yes you, you should be a whistleblower if you see something wrong you should speak up but more importantly that if you sort of like have conflict with like your colleagues or if you see some like a problem right in front of you um the best way to do it i think is just to address it openly uh, because you know sometimes it's just like no point going behind the scenes of like you know We'll, we'll, I think we'll touch on this about like gossiping or maybe not attacking the um, problem directly. And I think it's one of the things that we sort of like discussed before is about open communication. Like I definitely learned a lot from just um, being able to communicate openly, not just in my like in my professional sort of development, but also definitely in the like, academics. Where I know you've talked about sort of approach, uh, being open with our problems with like our instructors and stuff like that. So. I, for me, open communication isn't so much about being, you know, being blunt in a rude manner or sort of like just letting it how you feel. It's, um, it's all about being able to communicate sort of like the essential detail to the people who need to know about it and also delivering that in a professional, respectful manner. Um, mm-hmm. And that can be about anything. It can be about, you know, if you have, a, if you're experiencing a personal problem at work or something, if it's impacting your work or if you have sort of like a conflict with your, with your coworkers, um, how do you um, navigate and how do you, address that problem is I think it's a really core skill that I have a feeling that a lot of students won't be able to learn until they really step into the workplace Mm -hmm. and they 
realize you know how how to um how to navigate a situation and i guess you really hit the hammer yeah. on the head that there's there's really two dimensions to act or professional honesty yeah the first one is as as we were saying be honest when things are going wrong mm-hmm. and don't be deceitful the second one is be candid about things that could be going wrong with yourself and your emotions with your peers. Yeah. It's effective communication, yeah. right? It's communicating the message in such a way that it gets to the person and it's also professional. And oftentimes you'll look up, what does professional communication look like online? And they'll say something like, well, don't bring Just your emotions you to the workplace. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. And it could not be more incorrect to tell people that not to take their emotions to the workplace mm. because that's repressing your emotions is not making them better. It's just making them more likely to burst in a different way. Yeah. Or it's making you miserable, which makes you less productive, right? It's not about not bringing your emotions to the workplace. It's about managing them well. It, it's about managing them well and it's about uh, communicating them effectively. Mm. So if you had your dog die <laughs> over the weekend... Yeah you're understandably upset. Even if you don't want to tell your employer that your dog died, sending them an email or going to them and saying, look, I had a serious tragedy happen the other day and I'm still reeling it from it a little bit. I'm going to do my best. However, if something goes wrong, I just wanted you to know. Mm -hmm. There's nothing unprofessional about that. Mm -hmm. That's transparency. That's making something clear before a problem arises. Yeah. And it's doing it in a way that's quite effective. Mm-hmm. There's very few employees that aren't compassionate. I will say that there are some who are, and that is a serious problem. However, most of the time in my experience, even with the worst employers, there's a reason that there's human resources departments so that they can help you in situations like that. Yeah. So knowing that you have resources is an important step of being a professional and actually using those resources. Don't stigmatize resources in the workplace. They're there for good reasons, right? Yeah. So just don't don't forget that there are proper ways to communicate emotional channels at the workplace. No, I think you 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 raised a really interesting point right there. Whereby um, you know it's really important to communicate your feelings and your emotions, especially when it comes to your superiors. But this really brings like an important question mm-hmm. to me: What if you don't feel like comfortable, and what if you feel like there's always tension with your superiors? Because sometimes relationships with your superiors mm-hmm. and your colleagues can be pretty hard. Mm-hmm. And I, I think we're kind of like privileged right here because we feel that we can communicate openly in the office, and that's something that I there are times in my life where I realize that it's not the case for all the places um, that I've worked at. So how do you how how do you think people should navigate that? Like if they, they say like, yeah, Flynn, I know that I have to communicate my feelings, but oh my God, my colleagues look so um, unfriendly. My, my supervisor is so intimidating. How do you, you know, position yourself in that uh, tight situation? Well, for sure. And that is obviously difficult because, and I think that's why I mentioned that it's especially hard when you're new to the workplace and yeah. you have a boss who you probably see as a, a quote unquote professional already is that there's that power disparity there. Mm. There's this relationship wherein they control your pay. And sometimes that means a lot. Sometimes that means they control your life. Mm -hmm. But, and I know this is a privilege that we have living in Canada. As an employee, you need to know that you have rights. And that's something that a lot of young students don't know going into the workplace. I know I certainly didn't know it. I didn't know that I could say I'm uncomfortable performing this tasks that I think might endanger my safety in the workplace. You know, I used to work in a steel mill, yeah, right? Yeah. There's a lot of opportunities to do things which are very unsafe. And it's only been in the last decade or so. And and I would I would argue even less because it was less than a decade when I was working there that WMIS and all of these sort of organizations, safety organizations have really cracked down on proper safety enforcement, right? That's only become a very powerful and well-enforced narrative since since the 21st century has started, basically. And what we're seeing now is that bleeding into having your employer respect you and and your dignity as well, right? Which is an important thing that I think needs to be said. You have dignity as an employee, which your employer is required to respect. And if they don't, you do have rights. And that's something that you should be aware of. And I'm by no means an expert on said rights. And I wouldn't turn to myself or Lila for expertise on those. I would just say that if you ever find yourself in that situation, look out for them. Look out for what resources you have, what rights you have, and how you can most effectively exercise those rights. Mm -hmm. Because there are labor tribunals in BC and Canada, which you can which you can have access to. Perhaps you're part of a job which is unionized. You can turn to those mechanisms. They exist, and they exist for every job. They're they're provincially and federally regulated. 
So they're they're administered by the government. There aren't there aren't things that can be taken away from you, right? True. true. You, there 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 are laws against uh, wrongful termination. So I know it's really hard to do, especially when you're young. And and honestly, I I can honestly say that I didn't exercise them at all times when I should have. But there are things that you can ha- that you have access to which you should make use of. And so maybe we can flip that around and make our last point about not a situation necessarily. It could be mm-hmm. we're in you're talking about a par- power disparity, but perhaps we're talking about a situation where you've made friends in the workplace and you're used to a certain standard of behavior with your friends. Let's say at school where you have a relationship and you have a certain way of communicating with one another, which may not be appropriate in the workplace. In the workplace right. Yeah. And thus far, we've talked about the do's so far of, yeah. of, of professionalism, the do's in that uh, do be professionally honest and do approach your job as if it were serious. But this is this is a bit of a, a blurry line. What are the do's and don'ts of friend relationships in the workplace? Because sometimes those can be difficult because you care for your friends and you want to support them mm-hmm. and you want to laugh, you want to joke and, and what have you. But if the laughing and joking goes too far and you don't get your work done or hard, if you yeah. make a customer uncomfortable or something like that because you're you're joking about something with your friend while you're trying to help them, that's not inappropriate, right? You, you're not approaching your job seriously. It kind of bleeds into the first two. Mm-hmm. And that got me really thinking about how I think a lot of students, they when young professional when they come out of university they have this idea that like it's you know the people that you meet in your classes the people you meet in your clubs so you sort of like it's okay for them to form like a natural sort of like friendship Mm -hmm. um when that's happening yeah and like or just like you know to communicate whenever whenever Mm -hmm. but like i've uh this is something i'm just gonna be honest that i find that when i'm in this job right now i i feel very conscious about texting you after like 5 p.m sometimes because i know that's like oh my god should i ask him about work and, and when i thought i you know on vacation i was like i want to ask him about something but i felt like really in- intimidated to mm-hmm. sort of like contact you outside work hours um so i think this is uh something that a lot of young professionals would be like um maybe caught them off guard when they first entered the workplace like is it okay to you know um contact my colleagues on like a specific platform you know should i be mindful of the time yeah, I remember there was this one time I got sort of like a call at 1 a.m. for like a non-emergency situation. And I, I find that I, I, I really want to be like an open and accommodating colleague. But I think sometimes it's really important to set some limits and to tell people, you know, that I, I don't think this is cool. Um, but those setting boundaries and being firm on your limits is something that I've always been trying to like work firmly on. But I mm-hmm. feel like I'm definitely getting better at it right now. And it's quite difficult because may- maybe your friendship is close enough that they don't think that that's a big deal. Yeah. And and that's why oftentimes people will tell you don't work with your friends. Mm-hmm. And and I'm not saying that you, that you should follow that maxim per se, but there's a reason why that's sort of a, a, a wisdom that gets flooded about quite often is because it, it's, it, it's true to some aspect that having a work relationship with your friends can complicate things because there's certain expectations of both of you when you go back to the workplace. Mm. And that kind of complicates your existing relationship wherein maybe it isn't weird if you text me at 1 p.m., right? And it gets really difficult, right? It gets really difficult to draw those boundaries, and I think that's something that can't necessarily be be told to you. Mm -hmm. That's something that you you have to learn and you need to kind of figure out between each other. But I think the only thing that we can really add to that conversation is say, make sure you have that discussion. Make sure you make those boundaries, as you said, and make sure that you set them with each other if you haven't. And that is a conversation that you should have no matter how close you are. So we've talked about stuff like working with friends, but what is it like to develop a relationship with your um, yeah. you, with your <laughs> colleagues when it's outside of work? Because mm-hmm. I, I mean, I feel like sort of like lucky and like I do get to work with people that I really, really like. And sometimes I, I become friends with mm-hmm. them. Like I've met some some really um, cool people while working at here. And um, but how do you is it like a limit as to how much we should go or how? you know what's appropriate because I, I kind of noticed that while some people are very open to being friends but they're also kind of like kind of closed off mm-hmm. about um, what they want to share outside of the work uh, and some people are like really open they're like yeah add me on all my social media you yeah, can do yeah. it and everything's okay but I think I what I try to do is I definitely try to be like respectful of like the needs of, of some of my colleagues for those who are like not really okay with maybe like sharing like social media you know it's really important to respect their boundary 
boundaries. And I think that's the part, the piece about communication that you were mentioning before about being able to read people very well. You know, sometimes you just have to interpret based on their behavior, based on their body language. Yeah, I think reading people, figuring out what they want without without making them feel attacked or something. I know that some people would be like, well, they will feel really bad if they say like, no, I don't want you on my Facebook. Like, yeah. Well, I think I think that you raise a sort of difficult point where it's yeah. that identifying those boundaries without sort of having an open channel of mm-hmm, communication mm-hmm. takes a lot of emotional intelligence. Yeah. And I, I don't want to say that some people aren't emotionally <laughs> intelligent, but it, it takes a lot of recognition, which are which is hard for some people. It takes a lot of developing of that skill for you to be very good at it. And so if you ever find yourself in awkward situations like that, make sure you take the time to ask people what their boundaries are, just point blank. Yeah. Because sometimes it's really hard to tell. And you raise an interesting point about developing relationships with your coworkers after you get the job. And I remember almost every boss I've ever had, I've become great friends with. I had a boss well many years ago who I still go see concerts with. Wow. I haven't worked with him <laughs> for four years, but we still go to concerts together because we like all the same music, right? Mm. And it's great that you can make friends. Yeah. It's especially great that you can work with people that you enjoy spending time with. But there is that sort of difficulty sometimes where it's like, where does one spill into the other? I remember I had a, my, my most recent boss before this job. I love her to bits. She's one of the best people I've ever had in my life. She's such a good person. And anytime we'd ever have a difficulty and I'd ask her if something was wrong or something like that, you know, if we had a lapse in communication, she would she would always specify professionally, no personally yes (laughs) that's a good rule too that's a good way to say it yeah and 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 it's difficult to hear that right because it's it's an acknowledgement that we have two channels of relationship and i'm not saying that's inappropriate that's highly effective Mm -hmm. but it's it's hard to see a friendship that way right And, and i remember it was always hard to hear something like that right because it's like i can go to the workplace today and because you said professionally no i should be able to function normally but i care emotionally about, about, the, person, about yeah. the personal right it doesn't just mean it goes away mm. which is what makes those boundaries difficult and reinforces the notion that it's necessary to set them so with that we have three major conclusions for this session today and the first one is to take your profession seriously and what we mean by that is not just showing up on time and knowing that you have sort of important work to do but it also means understanding that you are a contributive and important member of the organization and that there are people who depend on you and it's also crucial that you are able to demonstrate sort of like a level of professionalism so that in the in the event that you want to move forward in your career you can have you know people supporting you and say that I see this person and I know that she takes she or she takes work seriously and the second one is professional integrity and Flynn mentioned a very important point about whistleblowing just now and what we mean by this is that you know if you see a problem um, that's not, not not being addressed or not being solved you should speak up and talk to the uh, relevant people who could um, solve the issue you should also practice really open staff communication meaning that if you have conflict with your colleagues or if you see a problem that you're not really happy with talk to the relevant people who can help you with that issue and be open and honest as possible as you can And finally, we talked about specifying and limiting boundaries in the workplace. And one of the examples we gave, what is the appropriate way to communicate with your colleagues and also um, how do you navigate a friendship at the workplace? And with that, I think it's really important that we put up one big disclaimer before we sign off. Obviously, if we're having a discussion about what constitutes professionalism and proper and what is proper in the workplace, in this era, it rightly evokes images of Me Too and Uh, What is appropriate and not appropriate with regards to uh, advances between your colleagues, whether they be men, women, or otherwise. And that is not something that we're experts on, and that's not something that I would have anybody refer to me for. Instead, I would direct someone uh, most readily to UBC Equity and Inclusion if you have any questions on that. That's just not something that I think we're prepared to talk about because it's not something that we've experienced necessarily, and it's not something that we have expertise on. So we just want to make it clear that that is a very important issue and that obviously has a place in this discussion, but it's not something that we can necessarily speak to. And in a similar vein, it's important to remember that it's not just that you need to behave properly or that you need to do anything. It's that every workplace is reciprocal. You have rights. Your employers have a way that they need to behave. And it's a conversation that you need to have amongst each other. And it's a conversation that needs to be open and reciprocal. So don't think about this as just a, this is what you have to do. It's also what other people should have us expected of them as well. And as always, it's important to remember that this is a discussion. These aren't sort of rules that we've devised from the top and constitute the be all and end all of what it means to be a professional. 
there is invariably going to be things that we missed or things that you may disagree with what we have said. So obviously we encourage you to tweet us if you disagree or if you want to add anything at UBC Learn and uh, at the same handle for Instagram. And as always, we'd like to thank you very much for tuning in and it was a pleasure having you. Thank you. Latte for here?